Yeah. The Kremlin's blizzard of lies and disinformation by telling the truth about Putin's war of choice and his war of aggression. Yeah. And we will work with our allies on the urgent need to protect other European countries that are not members of NATO and who could become targets of Putin's playbook of subversion and aggression. And we will resist any creeping temptation to accept what Putin is doing today as a fait accompli. There can be no creeping normalisation, not now, not in the months to come, not in the years ahead. We must strengthen NATO's defences still further. And so today I called for a meeting of NATO leaders, which will take place tomorrow, and I will be convening the countries that contribute to the Joint Expeditionary Force, which is led by the United Kingdom and comprises both NATO and non-NATO members. Last Saturday, I warned that this invasion would have global economic consequences, and this morning the oil price has risen strongly. The government will do everything possible to safeguard our own people from the repercussions for the cost of living. And of course, we stand ready to protect our country from any threats, including in cyberspace. Above all, the House will realise the hard and heavy truth that we now live in a continent where an expansionist power deploying one of the world's most formidable military machines is trying to redraw the map of Europe in blood and conquer an independent state by force of arms. And it's vital for the safety of every nation that Putin's squalid venture should ultimately fail and be seen to fail. However long it takes, that will be the steadfast and unflinching goal of the United Kingdom. I hope of every member of this House and every one of our great allies, certain that together we have the power and the will to defend the cause of peace and justice as we have always done. And I say to the people of Russia, again, whose president has just authorised an onslaught against a fellow Slavic people, I cannot believe that this horror is being done in your name or that you really want the pariah status that these actions will bring to the Putin regime. And to our Ukrainian friends, in this moment of agony, I say that we are with you and we are on your side. Your right to choose your own destiny is a right that the United Kingdom and our allies will always defend. And in that spirit, I join you in saying Slava Ukraini, and I commend this statement to the House. I now call the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In this dark hour, our thoughts, our solidarity and our resolve are with the Ukrainian people. Invading troops march through their streets. Missiles shell their cities. They have been cast into a war through no fault of their own, because Putin fears their freedom and because he knows that no people will choose to live under his bandit rule unless forced to do so at the barrel of a gun. The consequences of Putin's war of aggression will be horrendous and tragic for the people of Ukraine but also for the Russian people, who have been plunged into chaos by a violent elite who have stolen their wealth, stolen their chance of democracy and stolen their future. And we must prepare ourselves for difficulties here. We will face economic pain as we free Europe from dependence on Russian gas and oil and clean our institutions from money stolen from the Russian people. But the British public have always been willing to make sacrifice to defend democracy on our continent, and we will again. The consequences of Putin's actions will be felt throughout the world for years, and I fear for decades to come. Russia's democratic neighbours 
and every other democracy that lives in the shadow of autocratic power are watching their worst nightmare unfold. So all of us who believe in democracy over dictatorship, in the rule of law over the reign of terror, in freedom over the jackboot of tyranny, must unite and take a stand. Yeah. We must support the Ukrainian people in their fight, and we must ensure that Putin fails. Putin will eventually learn the same lesson that European tyrants learned in the last century, that the resolve of the world is harder than he imagines, that the people's desire for freedom burns brighter than he can ever extinguish, and that the light of liberty will prevail over his darkness. For that to happen, we must make a clean break with the failed approach to handling Putin, which after Georgia, after Crimea, after Donbass, has fed his belief that the benefits of aggression outweigh the costs. We must finally show him that he is wrong. That means doing all that we can to help Ukraine defend herself by providing weapons, equipment and financial assistance, as well as humanitarian support for the Ukrainian people. We must urgently reinforce and reassure our NATO allies in Eastern Europe, who now stand at the frontier of Putin's aggression. And the hardest possible sanctions must be taken against the Putin regime. It must be isolated, its finances frozen, its ability to function crippled. That means excluding Russia from the financial mechanisms like SWIFT and banning trade in Russian sovereign debt. I welcome the set of sanctions outlined by the Prime Minister just now and pledge opposition support for further measures. And there are changes we must make here in the UK. For too long, our country has been a safe haven for the money that Putin and his fellow bandits stole from the Russian people. Yeah. It must now change. Cracking open the shell companies in which stolen money is hidden will require legislation. Bring it forward immediately, Prime Minister, and Labour will support it, along with the other measures that the Prime Minister has just outlined. Thank you, and we will support it. Mr Speaker, this must be a turning point in history. We must look back and say that this terrible day was actually when Putin doomed himself and doomed his plan to reassert Russian force as a means of controlling Eastern Europe to defeat. We know how Putin operates, so we know how to defeat him. He seeks division, so we must stand united. He hopes for inaction, so we must take a stand. He believes that we are too corrupted to do the right thing, so we must prove him wrong. I believe we can, and in this dark hour, we can step towards the light. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. I want to say how grateful I am to the Right Honourable Gentleman for the terms in which he has just spoken and the robust support that he is uh, offering to the Government uh, and, and to uh, the Western Alliance, Mr Speaker, at a, at a very, very difficult time. And I think the whole House can be turning to some of the issues that he raised very briefly. I think the whole House can be proud of the, of the role that the UK has played in uh, pioneering military uh, support, logistical support uh, to the Ukrainians, the, the, way, the role that we played in bringing together a ferocious package of sanctions, uh, which we will now implement. And we will bring our allies together, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, to protect NATO. Uh, to show uh, that President Putin uh, will get a tougher Western alliance as a result of his actions, not a weaker Western alliance. And uh, I think, Mr Speaker, that uh, events will show that the Russian president has profoundly miscalculated. Uh, he believes that he is doing this for his own political advantage. I believe the exact opposite will prove to be the case uh, because of the resistance that will be mounted against what he is doing, not just in Ukraine, but around the world. And we will support 
those Ukrainians, uh, Mr. Speaker. We will support them uh, economically, diplomatically, politically, and yes, militarily as well. And I know that in due time we will succeed. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome my right honourable friend's statement this afternoon? This House and this country are united in our defence of democracy and our support for the Ukrainian people. Vladimir Putin has initiated war in mainland Europe. The response must be unequivocal and absolutely clear. So will my right honourable friend confirm that the government is putting in place every possible economic sanction so that Russia feels absolutely the cold wind of isolation and the Russian people understand that Vladimir Putin has brought their state to a pariah state. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, I thank my honourable friend, and she's absolutely right about what the government is uh, setting out to do, and I do indeed believe that that will be the result for Putin uh, and his cronies. We now come to the SNP leader. Mr Speaker, let me thank the Prime Minister for an advanced copy of the statement, and let me also welcome the very close contact he has kept with the Ukrainian President, of course, importantly, overnight. I was grateful that I had a chance to meet this afternoon with the Ukrainian Ambassador to the UK and indeed with Ukrainian MPs. Our thoughts and our support is very much with each and every one of them, as it is with all of the people of Ukraine. Mr Speaker, although last night's events have been prophesied and predicted for some time, the acts of Russian violence, aggression and tyranny are no less shocking. What we are witnessing is a full-scale invasion. It is an act of war. This is, first and foremost, an unprovoked attack on the peace and the innocence of Ukraine and of its people. <coughs> but it is equally an attack on international law, an attack on our European democracy, an attack on the peace that our continent has so carefully built over the last 75 years. President Putin, and President Putin alone, bears responsibility for these yeah. horrific acts. Yeah. And it is he and his Kremlin cabal who must pay a massive price for their actions. It is important to say to the Russian people that we know that Putin is not acting in their name. He is a dictator. He is an imperialist. He is a tyrant. He is much a threat to his own people as he is to all of us. Mr Speaker, this is a moment for unity, and it's especially a moment for European unity. All of the economic sanctions that are now finally being implemented have one clear objective, the complete economic isolation of the Russian state. Can the Prime Minister confirm that this is the objective and that he has agreed that with his international allies? That economic isolation must include sanctions on Putin and his network of oligarchs and agents, their expulsion from countries around the world, sanctions on his banks and their ability to borrow and function, and sanctions on his energy and mineral companies. And as I said yesterday, it must finally mean clearing up the sewer of dirty Russian money that has been running through the City of London for years. Yeah, yeah. And I know all the complications involved, but can I ask the Prime Minister that the actions to be taken to suspend Russia from the swift payment system, one of the steps that would hit the Putin regime the hardest. But just as we rightly seek to punish Putin, we must redouble our support and solidarity for the Ukrainian people. Can the Prime Minister give further details on the humanitarian aid being deployed and the plans in place to offer refuge and sanctuary where necessary to those that have been displaced? And what plans are in place to evacuate the families of UK citizens currently in Ukraine, given that commercial flights have now stopped? Mr Speaker, let's not fall for the Kremlin propaganda that they are prepared to soak up any sanctions. If we act now, if the sanctions are targeted enough, swift enough, severe enough, if we impose nothing less than economic isolation, Putin and his cronies will suffer the consequences of their actions. So let us act together. 
stand together, and most of all, let us stand with the people of Ukraine. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, can I thank again the, the right honourable gentleman for the uh, the wisdom and the statesmanship with which he has just uh, he's just spoken and. Uh, just on his points in particular, we've put a thousand uh, uh, troops on standby to help with the humanitarian exodus in the adjacent countries. Uh, we have uh, people in forward presence in the adjacent countries to help uh, UK nationals come out. And he's quite right, Mr. Speaker, that the way to uh, make these sanctions work, as uh, we discussed today in the G7, uh, where there is a, a great deal of unity, is that we do them together and we do them at the same time. And that's what we're doing. Can, can I just say to everybody, the Prime Minister has got some very important meetings. We'll be running this to 6.30. Those colleagues who don't get in, we are keeping a list like we did from the other day to try and ensure that everybody does get a voice in a very, very... You'll have to sit down. It's a very, very important matter. I now come to the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Tom Tugendhat. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I first of all pay huge tribute to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and his government today for introducing what sound like the toughest sanctions we've seen in uh, years. May I ask him, however, to look wider than simply the Russian people and to look at all those who are enabling Putin's economy, those who sit on boards of the businesses that finance him, whether they are former chancellors of Germany or former prime ministers of France. May I ask him to look here, close to home, at those who enable, who propagate the propaganda that is being used by Putin to undermine his own people and free people everywhere, and to update the Treason Act so that we can identify them and call them what they are, traitors. Can I also ask the Prime Minister one last question, which is when he speaks to people around the world, that he speaks with the truth that he can in Russian through the BBC Russian service and starts to broadcast in languages other than Russian into Russia so that all Russian peoples can know their oppression doesn't need to exist. They don't need to side with a tyrant. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I thank him very much. And he's absolutely right that we have to, uh, we have to look at the, those who abet uh, the Putin uh, regime. And there are, there are many, many of them. And that's why uh, we are looking at all sorts of ways in which we can address threats uh, to, to this state, uh, Mr Speaker. And we are, of course, uh, making sure that the messages uh, from this House which, is so, uh, which are so impressive in their unity, should, should be registered uh, by the people of Russia, because we mean uh, no ill towards them. They are as much, in many ways, the victims as the people of Ukraine, of uh, this appalling regime, and they need to know what's really going on. Dame Angela Edel. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, would the Prime Minister um, tell us uh, if he can, uh, what's going on with the Russian troops uh, going through Chernobyl, which sent a chill through a lot of people's thoughts when we heard about it? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. I thank the right honourable lady very much. I, I, I hesitate to give uh, the House a, a running comment on what seems a very fluid and very, uh, and very dangerous situation, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, she's right in what she says. Dr. Julian. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the best part of 50 years, Britain gave sanctuary to the governments in exile of the occupied Baltic states. If, as appears likely, Ukraine gets overwhelmed, will we offer to give sanctuary to a government in exile pending Ukraine's future freedom? Prime Minister. Uh, of course, I thank my moral friend. Of course, Mr. Speaker, we will give all uh, support that we can, uh, logistical or otherwise, as Britain always has done uh, to governments in exile. And at the point I made to President, uh, one of the points I made to President Zelensky uh, this morning was that it might, it might be necessary for him to find uh, a safe uh, place for him and his uh, and his cabinet to go. Ed David. Mr. Speaker, with President Putin responsible for this catastrophic human tragedy. Liberal Democrats join all sides to stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine, and I thank the Prime Minister for his statement. Today must be a wake-up call. The West has been too complacent over Putin's threat for too long. We have taken for granted our fragile alliances, so crucial for the defence of freedom, emboldening Putin this outrageous act of aggression. The West cannot be complacent any longer. So will the government 
reverse its proposed troop cuts to the British Army and offer far greater military support to our NATO allies in Eastern Europe. And Mr Speaker, Putin must face the most punitive of sanctions. The world must isolate Russia like the rogue state it is, including the state-backed oil giant Rosneft, 20% owned by BP. So will the Prime Minister commit to banning UK investment in Russian oil and gas companies with immediate effect? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, uh, on his uh, point about investment in, uh, in, in Russian oil and gas, as I have said, uh, we must move away uh, from uh, all our dependencies on Russian oil and gas, and that is the objective of the UK Government. We are well, lucky in this country that we have only 3 per cent of our gas uh, that comes uh, from Russia. Other European countries are in a much more exposed uh, position. On his point about supporting uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, we have, as he knows, uh, doubled the size of our commitment to Estonia. Uh, we have uh, gone uh, bigger in, in Poland. Another 350 Marines from 4-5 uh, Commando uh, were in the skies above uh, Romania. Uh, I do not believe there is another country in NATO that is currently doing more uh, to strengthen uh, NATO's eastern defences. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituency, Kensington, has strong historical connections with Ukraine, so I welcome this robust approach. My constituency also has seen significant property investments by Russian investors. Can I urge my right honourable friend to accelerate the introduction of a register of beneficial ownership of property? Uh, Minister. Uh, yes, she's completely right, and uh, we need to unpeel the facade of these companies, these shell companies, so we can see who owns uh, the property concern. Hilary Ben. Thank you very yes, much indeed, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's because John Stuart Mill was right when he warned that bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing, that the whole House will support the measures that the Prime Minister has just announced. Now, in his statement, he said our mission is clear diplomatically, politically, economically and eventually militarily. What did he mean by using the word militarily? Was he referring to providing further defensive weapons to enable Ukraine to defend itself? Prime Minister. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. I obviously don't want to go into uh, detail because the, uh, it is a, a very sensitive and difficult business. But yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have done. Uh, we continue to do so, and I believe I have the support of the House uh, in intending uh, to continue to do so. Bob Seeley. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Prime Minister for his words and his, if I understand correctly, early commitment to an economic crime bill and a kleptocracy cell. In relation to that. Will there be a foreign lobbying bill? Will there be amendments to Libel and Data Protection Act to stop unscrupulous law firms offering intimidation services to oligarchs and kleptocrats? And will the NCA be properly funded, as the ISC report suggested, so it will be able to take on the kleptocrats, the autocrats and the oligarchs in this country? Uh, Mr Speaker, I am grateful. We've, as, as I said in my uh, opening statement, uh, we are setting up a, uh, a new uh, combating kleptocracy cell in the National uh, Crime Agency to target the very uh, individuals that he, uh, that he mentions. Sarah Chapia. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Let us be under no illusion. We are on the brink of a potentially enormous humanitarian crisis, which could see massive loss of life and widespread suffering for the Ukrainian people, and all to suffer the warped czar complex of the Russian president. The attack on Ukraine is also likely to cause mass displacement of people, potentially triggering a significant refugee crisis in Europe. So can the Prime Minister tell us what he is doing to support the Ukrainian people who stay and those who choose to flee? She makes a very important point, and I am grateful, Mr Speaker, because the humanitarian impact threatens to be uh, enormous, and uh, that is why I have said what I have said uh, about supporting uh, those refugees as they, as they come out of, of Ukraine. 
Uh, but we've got to make sure that we do everything we can to stabilise uh, the Ukrainian economy, uh, to support uh, the government and the, uh, as far as we possibly can. And that's why yesterday, uh, on Tuesday, I should say, I announced uh, the $500 million uh, extra package of development aid on top of the £100 million uh, we've already given. Uh, other countries, uh, our friends and allies, uh, are working with us to do much more. Sharon Bitter. Does the Prime Minister agree that the international order, as envisaged in the Atlantic Charter of 1941, has been the most successful in the history of freedom and democracy? And as one of the architects of that order, we have a special responsibility to defend it. And whilst today's sanctions are extremely welcome, it cannot just be economic measures. We need a fundamental review of our military capability, including revisiting the integrated review, whose assumptions may now be out of date. Mr Speaker, the the, the, the integrated review begins uh, with the assertion that the most important area for our national security uh, is the Euro-Atlantic area, as I I believe I said to the Honourable Gentleman opposite uh, on Tuesday. And that remains fundamental, and and, and that's why uh, we've, uh, we've continued with the investment uh, that we have in, uh, in NATO, where the, where the second biggest uh, funder of NATO is, uh, as, as, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, and, but he's, he's, my right honourable friend knows, but he's right in what he says about what's at stake. This is about the whole idea of that wonderful thing that uh, was so inspiring when some of us were, were, were young, uh, of a Europe whole and free, that fantastic revolution that happened in 1989 and 1990 when communism fell, yeah. Mr Speaker. It was a, it was a great moment uh, for humanity, and we mustn't allow it to slip through our fingers. Yeah. Clive Lewis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to say to the people of Norwich uh, that we show our solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Yeah. Um, but warm words will not defend uh, the Ukrainian people. I have been speaking to people who have been uh, liaising with Ukrainian trade unions, people who have been fighting privatisation and wage cuts. But they say one thing, that they will not run from their homes. They will defend their families. Those people need to be able to defend themselves. So I support the Prime Minister's uh, assertion that we will be providing more defensive capabilities for that end. But let me say one thing, uh, Prime Minister and Mr Speaker. Will you agree, Prime Minister, that we must have an end to this by a negotiated settlement and not by an escalation of military means? Mr Speaker, I think the whole House, uh, everybody in the world, uh, would want President Putin to have chosen the path of negotiation. Uh, He had that moment. Uh, And that's why, if you remember, we had that uh, discussion in this House on Tuesday about that that perilous moment which we all discussed. He had that opportunity. I'm afraid he's missed it. He's chosen the path of overwhelming violence and destruction. And I'm afraid that puts us on a very, very different course. And we have to accept that reality. David Davis. Everybody will wholeheartedly support the Prime Minister's sanctions, hopefully against all 140 Russian oligarchs that support Putin and against all the major banks. The Prime Minister also described the Russian state as a pariah state. And he's right, because they have broken international criminal law on a major scale. Can we actually implement our view of the pariah state by ensuring that everybody involved in that decision, if they leave Russia to go abroad, face international criminal sanctions wherever they go. Yeah. I, I thank my right hon. Friend, and that is exactly what we can now do, thanks to the measures uh, that this House has passed. Neil Hamley. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, this morning we woke to the worst possible news, uh, and I make no apology in hoping for a diplomatic solution. However, my party and I condemn the escalating Russian aggression. This is a fluid and developing situation, but we are now in uncharted territory. Um, I can update the House that whilst there have been calls in this place uh, for Alex Hammond to uh, cease broadcasting on Russia Today. Negotiations have obviously been happening in the background, and I can confirm that he has suspended broadcasting on Russia Today. But we must prepare we must prepare for the worst and I would ask the Prime Minister what 
what strategy is he bringing forward to increase the capacity of North Sea oil and gas so that we can support ourselves and EU member states and protect our people from a further increase in the cost of living? Um, Mr Speaker, I, I must say I disagree uh, profoundly with what he uh, has had to say about uh, negotiating now. I don't think that that, that option is, uh, is open to us. We, we must do our, our best to support and protect uh, the people of, uh, of Ukraine and, uh, and working with our international friends and allies to constrict uh, what uh, Vladimir Putin can do. And uh, on, on his point about uh, about Russia today, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I simply observe that uh, the, the former leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party is a uh, his leader. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. His leader. I, I, I understand the, the pleas he entered in defence and, and mitigation. Uh, they don't seem to cut much ice uh, with me. Sir Graham Brady. <laughs> Steve Crabb. Steve Crabb. Steve Crabb is the name. Of Steve. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, I strongly welcome the further set of sanctions announced by the Prime Minister this evening, and we look forward to further steps being taken in the days ahead and not being held back by perhaps some of the slower moving. Uh, members of, of the alliance in Europe. But does the Prime Minister agree with me that if sanctions are really to bite on Putin and his gangster government, then inevitably it will mean cost and inconvenience to UK economic interests. But that cost and inconvenience is of, will be of as nothing compared to what the people of Ukraine are going through, and we stand with them this evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I'm afraid he's my, my honourable my honourable friend is, is right. It will mean cost. It will mean uh, inconvenience. It will mean difficulty for us in the UK. But that will be a price worth paying, Mr. Speaker, for defeating the objectives of Vladimir Putin and showing that aggression does not pay. Yeah. Yeah. Diana Johnson. Yes. Name Diana Johnson. Could I just uh, follow up on the question from the Honourable Member for the Isle of Wight about the combating kleptocracy cell in the National Crime Agency and just seek from the Prime Minister um, a view whether additional powers will be required for the National Crime Agency and additional resources for them to do their work? I, I thank her very much. They, they will, of course, they have uh, uh, plenty of existing statute, but the additional powers uh, that they will have, amongst other things, will be the ability to, uh, uh, to peel back the facade of, of ownership, which I think will be extremely valuable. Jonathan Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, whilst this terrible, appalling incident is, of course, directly the cause of Russia. I think it is appropriate that we also recognise that over the last 14 years, the UK, the EU, the US collectively have not been attentive to Russia in the way that we should. Yeah, yeah. Can my right honourable friend now say that whatever happened in the past, moving forward, we are not going to let Russia fall between our fingers again? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, I think the lesson of 2014 is that the whole of the West failed to respond in the way that we should. And when a sovereign country uh, was invaded and part of that country uh, was occupied, uh, I'm afraid it was quite wrong uh, that we tried to manage the situation with the, the various diplomatic processes that we did, which in the end produced absolutely nothing except finally uh, this catastrophic invasion today. We have to a bitter lesson, Mr Speaker, about how to deal with Vladimir Putin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the Prime Minister that it seems like the curtain has now come down on that era that began in 1989, and we've lived in an era of change since then. This now feels like a change of era. In this new era, the permissive environment that we created for the Kremlin's quartermasters to live, to invest, and to party in London, sometimes with the Prime Minister himself, that must now, that must now come to an end. So let me ask. So let me ask the Prime Minister this. Will he undertake to ensure that every visa issued to a Russian dual national is now reviewed? 
and where proximity to President Putin is proven, that citizenship should be stripped away. Yes, Mr Speaker, we are doing that, though I think it is, I, I just think it is it's worth the House uh, remembering the point that I made the other day, not every Russian uh, is a bad person, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, Speaker. Can I welcome the package of sanctions the Prime Minister has set out? And whilst I understand why it's not been possible to suspend Russia from the SWIFT payment system at this stage, can I ask what work we're doing with our European allies to offer them reassurance so that eventually we can get to a position when they can be suspended? Because that is by far and away the biggest thing that will isolate the Russian economy. My honourable friend is spot on. The, the biggest thing would be uh, to, if everybody stopped taking Russian hydrocarbons. But SWIFT, uh, Swift is, uh, is extremely important, and uh, it's a Belgian company, as I'm sure the House uh, knows. Uh, we're, we're raising it. We're trying to uh, make progress with our, our friends. But for obvious reasons, it has to be done uh, in unison. Sure, and MacDonald. I'm grateful, uh, yeah. Mr Speaker. Uh, this morning I spoke with uh, friends in Kyiv who were leaving the country with their family, their children, and we've all seen the scenes from the capital of cars trying to get out. So I send my uh, deepest thanks to the embassy team there who are doing all they can to support people. But can I ask the Prime Minister about two areas of support for Ukraine? Economic support and continuing uh, support for defensive capability. Will both of those areas of support intensify, and can he assure the House, I see the Foreign Secretary uh, telling me so, but can he assure the House that the Government will continue the deepest possible conversations with the Government in Ukraine to ensure that no matter the assault that comes to it from Vladimir Putin, we will be supporting them in a deeply meaningful sense? Yes, yeah. uh, yes on, the, on, the, on that last point, the answer is certainly yes, Mr Speaker. And, you know, just for instance, uh, uh, the other day I was looking at uh, two British minesweepers being refitted in uh, Recife, as I'm sure he, uh, he knows, which are due to go to, to Ukraine. The question will be access, Mr Speaker. That's what it all uh, depends on. Sir Robert Butler. Mr Speaker, it's crystal clear from this act of naked aggression that Putin doesn't seek Finlandization on his borders. He seeks at best to recreate a Belarus in the south or at worst to dismember the sovereign state of Ukraine. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that that does mean that we need to build upon the outcome of our integrated defence review? We do need to think differently about Eastern Europe from the past. And then at home, with his announcement on bringing forward economic crime measures, it seems that there is a consensus in this House that could allow us to bring forward emergency legislation to bring uh, those important measures to really hit those people hard and hit them now. Speaker, I, I think that that is clearly the, the will of the House and it is the will of the Government and that's why uh, we'll be uh, taking those important measures, bringing them forward uh, on Monday. Shinara Ali. Mr Speaker, my thoughts are with the Ukrainian people at this time. And while I welcome the sanctions the Prime Minister has announced today, can he update the House on whether he plans to sanction the major state-owned Russian banks such as Serba Bank and Gazprom Bank and the non-state bank Alpha Bank. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. David Mundell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Ukrainian POW chapel at Lockerbie in my constituency is a focal point for the Ukrainian diaspora in Scotland, and prayers are being said there for their fellow countrymen. But what uh, Ukrainians in the UK have identified being grateful for the military support that has already been forthcoming is that there is an immediate need for medical battlefield supplies, for warm clothing for troops and for camouflage gear. And can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, uh, assure the House that they will be forthcoming? Uh, I, I thank my uh, right honourable friend very much. Uh, he's, uh, he raises a very important issue and uh, uh, we, are, we are working on exactly those uh, uh, supplies uh, right now. Van Jones. I thank the Prime Minister for his statement and very much welcome the sanctions that he's announced today. But can he give an assurance that the sanctions that are going to target individuals will also uh, uh, target uh, relatives and connected parties? And like the Honourable Right Honourable Member for Swindon, um, he mentioned the Economic Crime Bill. We've got the, um, the uh, review of the Official Secrets Act and the Foreign Registration Act. 
why can't we bring them forward and do them now? Yeah. They would get huge support. Uh, and we've been waiting for some of these for nearly two years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I can, I can tell him that we will certainly be uh, making sure that we uh, are able to sanction and do sanction uh, relatives and, uh, uh, and other interested parties. And, and there will be, be a rolling programme uh, of intensifying sanctions. Chris Bibblad. Having been one of the officials that accompanied the then Defence Secretary to both Moscow and Kiev in 1993, I am in no doubt that the signatories of the United States and the United Kingdom on the Budapest Memorandum uh, gave Ukraine the confidence to give up its nuclear deterrent. Um, will my right honourable friend uh, support the United States, to whatever extent it is prepared to go, um, to stand alongside the United States in giving whatever military support it is prepared to do so uh, to Ukraine? My right honourable friend is absolutely right to remind the House of the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, which uh, uh, had exactly that effect and created exactly that obligation uh, on us as one of the signatories. Very Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister will be aware that we are on this side of the House uh, very keen on these sanctions. Although, does he share with me the worry that the record of driving out dictators and demagogues with, shape, uh, with, with, with these sanctions isn't always that successful. Does he share my concern that if, you've, if we've read what Putin has been saying these last few hours, here's a man that might not stop at Ukraine. He might go into a NATO country. And are, are we playing that scenario? Because many of us think that might be the next step. Uh, the right honourable gentleman is, is absolutely right to raise that appalling possibility. Uh, and it is vital that we reaffirm again that under Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, we stand four square behind every one of our NATO allies and, and uh, will come to their defence. Speaker, can I uh, say to my honourable friend that with Ukrainian men and women dying to fight against the Russians for their freedom today, those who are calling for negotiation at this point can only please that rambling wreck of a neo-Nazi sitting in the Kremlin and they should be shunned. Secondly, can I just say to my honourable friend today, the ambassador uh, from Ukraine asked desperately whether NATO would look at a no-fly zone. I know it's a difficult choice, but could my honourable friend step to the dispatch box and make it clear that in this particular case he rules nothing out? Mm. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I know that uh, my right honourable friend is a uh, is a, is a great military expert, and, I, and, I, and, he, and he will understand. Uh, and I understand the attractions of the, of, of the no-fly zone. I remember uh, the no-fly zone that was created in uh, 1991, I, as, I, as I recall, in, uh, in northern Iraq. Uh, the situation here is very, is very different. Uh, the, we would face the risk of having to shoot down uh, Russian planes, Mr. Speaker, uh, and that is something that I think the, uh, the House would want to, uh, to contemplate uh, with, with caution. Lord Russell Moyle. Speaker. In locking out Russian state money, I hope the Prime Minister can give me a reassurance that that will include our overseas territories and dependencies that must be included in this. And I note that there are, Mr. Speaker, protests in a number of Russian cities across Russia at the moment, and celebrities in Russia have been speaking out. I do hope that we will be offering all the support that we can to those people who are likely to be shunned by the fascist imperialist Putin regime. Yes, and, uh, and can I say, Mr Speaker, that one of the reasons why uh, I want to keep our fantastic British Embassy staff uh, in Moscow, e even though uh, the temptation is there simply to sunder uh, diplomatic relations uh, with Putin, I want to keep them there uh, to support groups uh, such as the, uh, the ones he mentions. Bob Stewart. Mr Speaker, I have given evidence for war crimes trials. It was uh, genocide and crimes against humanity the people were charged with. Could I ask my right honourable friend and the House to agree with me that any Russian who kills a Ukrainian must remember that one day they may well be brought to court <coughs> for crimes against humanity or genocide? Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and not just any Russian combatant uh, Mr. Speaker, but anyone who sends a Russian uh, into, into battle uh, to kill innocent Ukrainians. Bill Esterson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
President Zelensky has called for the toughest possible sanctions, for them to be the toughest possible, that must mean immediate. So in his statement, he talked about in the next session for the economic measures, including on Companies House and on the Register of Overseas Property Ownership. But in answer to the Right Honourable Member for Swindon, he said something about bringing forward on Monday. Which of these is it? And if it is Monday, will it have the same effect as is required for that immediate action? We'll be bringing it forward on Monday, Mr. Speaker, and we want to have, uh, and we want, I hope, and I, I'm grateful for the support of the opposition, uh, we want immediately to start uh, cracking down on these individuals. Jesse Norman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The whole House will welcome the enhanced package of sanctions that the Prime Minister has announced today. But can I raise the question of football, much beloved to Russian hearts, and in particular issues of ownership? of property and of shareholdings and of the future participation of Russian clubs in international matches. He's right. Uh, my my right honourable friend is completely right. Uh, the Russians attach a great deal of sentimental importance to, uh, to football and uh, they, they, they hope to have the, the UEFA Championship uh, final in, uh, in St Petersburg. I cannot for the life of me uh, see how that can currently go ahead. Liz Savile Roberts. Putin's war on Ukraine is brutal, illegal and a calculated attack on peace and stability in Europe. Plaid Cymru fully supports the actions and sanctions announced today. Putin, his cronies and their personal fortunes must pay for their actions. On a visit to Ukraine, Plaid Cymru leaders spoke to Ukrainian soldiers, government officials and organisations, admiring the Ukrainian people for their strength and their resilience, and they are now in harm's way. With Poland organising medical assistance and Slovakia opening its borders to refugees, will his government mobilise and resource a global effort to support and aid people fleeing this horrific conflict? Uh, again, Mr Speaker, I, I thank her very much for her, uh, her support and her, her resolve. And uh, I, I want to assure her that we're, of course, working with our international friends uh, to, to uh, prepare for a humanitarian crisis. Deanna Davison. Speaker, earlier this afternoon I had the opportunity to speak to you on a Zoom call with a number of Ukrainian MPs who were all calling for additional support. One of the key things they were discussing is concerns that their communications networks may get shut down. So can I urge the Prime Minister to ensure we're doing all we can to provide things like satellite phones to make sure they can still communicate, not just internally, but with us here in the UK too? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, she, she, she's absolutely right. The Honourable uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, there is a threat to communications already, and we're observing it in the uh, the contacts that we're having with uh, with people in in Ukraine. Satellite phones uh, certainly are an option, and we'll be uh, we'll be looking at that. Sarah Owen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've rightly heard a lot about tougher trade sanctions today, but nothing about ridding Russian state influence from our democracy. Will the Prime Minister commit to investigating all political donations received from people with links to Putin, and will his government finally bring forward measures to clean up the corrupt Russian money that for far too long has been laundered in the UK? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Mr Speaker, all, all political donations are properly registered and, uh, and, and, and monitored, and, uh, I, and I can tell her that uh, we are putting forward uh, and progressively over the last a uh, few days and weeks, uh, and today, uh, the biggest ever package uh, to crack down on dirty Russian money, uh, not just from Russia, but from anywhere. Steve Baker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I welcome these sanctions today. My right honourable friend has been crystal clear that all Europe needs to end dependence on Russian oil and gas. Could he tell us a little bit more about how he intends to see that that comes to pass? The, 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 thank you. I thank you. I thank my right honourable friend. The, the, the key thing is for, to get people, first of all, to recognise the scale of their dependency, as in any addiction. Uh, and um, that's what we're, we're doing. And uh, the UK government's been making that point the whole time to our friends because it's got worse since 2014. Uh, but what we're also doing is helping countries, for instance, in the, in the Baltic states, uh, to go further and faster uh, with renewable technology. Daniel Zeitner. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think everyone knows that the Ukraine is a major producer of grain, and unfortunately, because of these awful events, there are likely to be consequences for many countries, including our own. Could I ask the Prime Minister to look again at our food security proposals and make sure that we are secure ourselves and not reliant as, so much as we have been in the past? Yeah, he's absolutely right, and, uh, and, and food security is an important consideration. And, and one, of the, one of the many things that, uh, that our fantastic Ukrainian uh, community have have done in the last few years is, is help us in that very sector. Andrew Bridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that Western Europe's ongoing reliance on Russian oil and gas has been a major factor in emboldening President Putin in the mistaken belief that he can invade his peaceful neighbour with relative impunity? And in the UK, shouldn't we refocus our energy policy on maximising the use of our own natural resources, looking again at fracking while we invest in low carbon alternatives? Yes, it, but the uh, Honourable Gentleman is totally right. Um, my honourable friend is totally right when he, uh, he talks about the excessive uh, dependence on, on, on hydrocarbons. We're moving away from it in this country. Uh, I do think in the, there is a, a merit, I think he and I might be in agreement on this, there is a merit in, the, in a transitional phase in continuing uh, with the, uh, the, the use of, of hydrocarbons in this country uh, rather than pointlessly importing them uh, from abroad. I'm a little bit. Putin's imperial bloodlust won't stop at Ukraine. We're rightly focused on sanctions, military and humanitarian support and our commitment to Ukrainian freedom. But the Prime Minister knows there's been a phenomenal increase in Russian submarine activity over the last 20 years. Our undersea cables carry more than 95% of all Western military, diplomatic, commercial, financial and personal communications. The consequences of these cables being weaponised <coughs> is terrifying. Can he assure me that countering this threat is part of our ongoing dialogue with allies? Yeah. She is absolutely right, and uh, the, there is a, a continual uh, struggle going on beneath the surface of the sea, as she knows, uh, between uh, submarines that are out to, uh, to sever uh, cables and, and, and uh, those of us who are trying to make sure that those links are, are maintained. Sir Charles Walker. Mr Speaker, following on from my right honourable and gallant friend's question about war crimes, I suspect those crimes are already being committed uh, by Russian soldiers against their Slavic brothers and sisters. Can the Prime Minister join with his uh, NATO heads of state setting out at an early stage how war crimes will be prosecuted so all Russian soldiers, field officers, generals and, of course, as the Prime Minister said, politicians are brutally aware of where, we're, where they will end up in a few years' time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. He, he is absolutely right, uh, and that, thank him. I thank him very much, my, my honourable friend. That's why we're uh, we're working on setting up a particular uh, international uh, war crimes tribunal for those involved in uh, war crimes in, in the Ukraine theatre. This has been incredibly ruthless. President Putin is also incredibly rich with one assessment saying that his personal wealth is up to $200 billion. So can the Prime Minister ensure that President Putin himself pays uh, a heavy price by targeting his own cash and assets? Yes, uh, in, absolutely, uh, Mr Speaker, and not just him, uh, but as the House has heard over the last few days, uh, as many of his uh, immediate cronies and family uh, as we can hit. Sakib Bhatti. Mr Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for all that he's done. Uh, just before the statement, I spoke to some of the Ukrainian protesters who are outside. Uh, one of them was holding back tears as she spoke about her mother in a cellar as her house is surrounded by Ukrainian tanks. So any member of this house who's asking for a negotiated settlement needs to go and speak to them because all they want is a, to live their lives as free and peaceful people. Will the Prime Minister confirm that the, to the people of Ukraine that he will do everything he can to end the tyranny of Putin and that he will do everything he can to, to make sure that they live as a peaceful and free people? Yes, I certainly can confirm that, Mr Speaker. And what I can also say is that I believe uh, in... This in, by making this invasion, the, I, I think that uh, President Putin has done uh, more than anybody else to bring his regime uh, to an end, uh, because I think in the end he will pay a huge price uh, for what he has done, and I, I know that this House will want to make, make it so. Colin Thank you. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, can I welcome and support the measures um, outlined by the Prime Minister uh, today? Putin is a gangster and a despot who has been trying to undermine and subvert democracy across the world for years. Uh, one of the tools that he uses is through political donations to political parties, including in this country. Will the Prime Minister commit today to ridding uh, the democracy in London? From uh, to de- de- reading Russian money out of democracy yeah, yeah. in this country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, of course, Mr. Speaker. Flake Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland today triggered Article 4 of the North Atlantic Treaty, and I think I heard that we are going to be joining in those discussions. But can my right of one friend assure our NATO allies in Eastern Europe that we stand firmly with them, particularly the Baltic states that have significant Russian populations? Thank her very, I thank you very much. She's completely right. And that's why one of the first things we did was to strengthen uh, our presence in, uh, in Estonia in the way that I've described. Uh, and uh, our, our Canadian friends are strengthening their presence in, in Latvia. Uh, and uh, we will make sure that uh, we give the, the Baltic states in particular, uh, who, who, who seceded uh, from the Soviet Union, who became free and independent at that amazing moment, give them all the security that they deserve. Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There's overwhelming evidence that Russian state actors <coughs> have been involved in trying to disrupt and destabilise Western democracies using social media platforms such as uh, Facebook. So what is the government doing to, uh, to ensure that this isn't used in these events? Yeah. Well, <coughs> Mr Speaker, as I said, I think in an answer uh, a couple of days ago, we've got no evidence of, uh, of, uh, of disruption of UK uh, elections or electoral events as, as a result of, uh, of Russian activity. But the online harms bill uh, is there uh, to provide such protections. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend for his statement and indeed thank the Leader of Her Majesty's Opposition for his supportive and moving words. Um, but can I also reinforce the point made by my honourable friend for Huntington? Why has it come to this pass? How has the West in general and the United Kingdom in particular been so asleep at the switch for such a long period of time? And it, I commend the Defence and Security Review, but isn't it now time? to ask what the permanent and impartial machinery of our government does, failing to provide ministers with consistent advice about the strategic threats that our country faces. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I think there are are all sorts of reasons for uh, the the failure of the West to take sufficient account of the threat of Vladimir Putin since 2014, Uh, but the the two biggest uh, are oil and gas. Nick Smith. Mr Speaker, with cyber attacks and falsehoods, Russia is peddling lies today. Now, observers on the ground are crucial to relay the truth. Now, in recent weeks, the UK has withdrawn its team from the OSCE special monitoring mission because staff safety is key. But can the Prime Minister look again to support international efforts like this to get to the facts and counter Russian disinformation. Yeah. I, I thank the MMR teams. Uh, that they're wonderful. I've, I've met them, and, and they, they do a, a fantastic job. I'm sorry that they've had to be withdrawn for the for the for the uh, duty of care reasons that he rightly uh, alludes to, and uh, we will keep it under constant review. Liam Fox. The uh, 1994 Budapest Memorandum saw Ukraine give up its nuclear weapons in return for a security guarantee not only signed by Britain and the United States, but by Russia. Does my right honourable friend believe that Ukraine would have been invaded had it retained its nuclear weapons? And what does it say about the value of a Russian signature on any international agreement? Well, it's clear uh, that uh, President Putin uh, sets no store by international law, whatever, and he's, uh, that is just one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the legal obligations that he has torn up. Kirsty Black. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, we awoke this morning to images of innocent families cowering in tube stations. We know the Putin regime's uh, propensity for oppression and tyranny, particularly when it comes to minorities. Uh, Will the Prime Minister ensure that humanitarian aid is delivered not just in concert with other international partners, but also with third sector organisations? 
Yes, of course. The third sector plays an invaluable role. Rem Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the Prime Minister's statement and his specifically ruling out the threat of creeping normalisation, because this House should be un under no doubt that uh, Putin is well prepared. He has hundreds of billions of, of foreign currency reserves. He has a military that has been tested. And will the Prime Minister do everything he can to convert the current intent into frameworks that cement our intent over time? Because he is betting on the fact that it won't be. He, my my honourable friend is absolutely right because the uh, it, the the plan that uh, the G7 have agreed on and our friends and partners have agreed on is that Putin must fail. Putin must not succeed in this venture. Uh, but we've got to put in place all the steps we need to take diplomatically, economically, and yes, militarily, in order to ensure that that is the case. And that's what we're doing. Very good. The Prime Minister is right to have set out the most stringent possible set of sanctions against the Government of Russia. Um, can he outline for the House what the implications will also be for cooperation at the International Space Station? Uh, I, I, thank him. I, I thank him very much. Uh, I, we will have to see uh, what, what, what further downstream effects there are on, on collaboration of all kinds. I must say that hitherto, uh, I have been broadly in favour of continuing uh, artistic and scientific uh, collaboration, but uh, in the current circumstances, it's hard to say, see how even those uh, can continue as normal. Sir John Hayes. Speaker, the mix of uh, practice and principle is the test of democratic politics, exemplified at its best when this House comes together in common cause. The test of leadership is the mix of vision and will, and the Prime Minister is to be commended for his willful, clear-sighted determination. So will he now reassure the House that he's in close touch with those countries close to Ukraine, where nerves will be frayed, and that will he send them an urgent message that this House and this nation will always stand alongside and behind free nations? Yeah. He is, uh, the right honourable gentleman, as so often, is precisely right, and that's why, uh, together with my uh, right honourable friends, the Defence Secretary, the Foreign Secretary, uh, we've been visiting uh, Poland, uh, Romania, uh, the Balts, uh, all the all those who who are now feeling such deep unease at what is happening. Well, Mr. Carmack, Mr. Speaker, as we speak, the Sovcom flot tanker NS Challenger is berthed at Sulemvo in Shetland, taking on a load of crude oil for export. Softcom Flot, as the Prime Minister may know, is a company owned and operated by the Russian government. My constituents, Mr Speaker, are asking me why they should be loading oil onto a Russian tanker while Russian troops are marching into the Ukraine. I cannot think of any good answer to give them. So, can the Prime Minister tell me, will anything that he has announced today ensure that that will not happen again in the future? Yeah. Uh, well, I can tell him, th I thank him very much, and I will, I will of course, immediately investigate uh, what, what uh, uh, is happening with so the Softcom flot uh, oil tanker. Uh, but the, the result of the measures that the House passed uh, the other day is that we can now target any entity, any company uh, that has any relation uh, with the Russian state. So, we have that power. Speaker, tyrants and megalomaniacs invade countries because they think they can get away with it. And the way to deal with bullies is to stand up with them. So I'm sure he will acknowledge that the way the West responds to this aggression will have repercussions not just for Russia and Ukraine, but for other bullies like China as well. And will he be mindful of the need to show support to Russians' smaller southerly neighbours, especially Georgia and Armenia, who feel particularly vulnerable at this time? Yeah. Yes, I, I thank him. He's, he's, he's right, because the, the read across, the knock-on, uh, is obvious for, uh, for Georgia and Armenia. What he, what he proposes to create uh, Putin is a new, a new sphere of influence, a new Yalta, in which uh, those countries come behind his new Iron Curtain. Stephen Wakeford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, as a member of this House with Ukrainian heritage, this issue particularly troubles me. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his tone of this statement and the resolute and swift action that he's proposing in tackling Russia, but the resolute and swift support he's offering to the people of Ukraine. 
During his speech, he also highlighted the issues of the cost of living and the rise of uh, fuel prices. Could he also touch on what further action the government will take in order to address that issue? Uh, I thank him very much, and I think he's, uh, he's, he's quite right, because I think people across the country will be thinking about the effect on, on us all of the increase in the price of, uh, of, of oil and gas as, as a result of uh, a war in, in Ukraine. Uh, we will continue to do everything we can to, to help people to abate the cost, uh, to support people through, uh, through councils, through all the funds that we're, we're giving, the, the, uh, the, the reduction in, in council tax, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but the best thing we, that we can do is ensure that people are in uh, good, uh, well-paying jobs. And that is, uh, in that, we are certainly succeeding. Uh, but the, in, the, in the medium and the long term, we've got to have more self-reliance in this country on our own energy supplies. And that is, uh, that is what this government is also uh, committed to building. Jeffrey Clifton Brown. Yeah, Mr. Speaker. One of the most important economic sanctions we can take against Russia is by freezing its sovereign debt. Will my right honourable friend confirm that the bill proposed on Monday on economic crime will include powers to do so? Uh, Mr Speaker, we're taking the most uh, powerful uh, measures against uh, Russia uh, and Russia, the Russian economy that have ever uh, been taken, I think probably the most powerful ever taken by any country, and uh, Russia will no longer be able to raise uh, any, any sovereign debt uh, on UK markets. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Prime Minister what um, support we, we will be providing Ukrainian citizens settled in the UK who wish to reunite with their family members still residing in Ukraine. Many have watched their cities rapidly, rapidly get caught up in this conflict and are keen to know what more we could be doing to support them to reunite their families. Uh, we, Mr Speaker, we will make sure that we support uh, Ukrainian nationals who uh, need to uh, leave to visit their, uh, to come to this country to, uh, to meet their, their, uh, their relatives. Of course we'll do that. Stephen McPartham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am proud the Prime Minister in this country are leading international support for our friends in Ukraine. Domestically, will the Prime Minister be providing more support for organisations such as our NHS, public sector organisations and businesses that will now be the subject of Russian cyber attacks? He is right to, to point to this risk. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and I, I think it's, it's foresighted. We are we're investing massively in, uh, in cyber protection. I think another £2.6 billion pounds, uh, we're putting in. Uh, I think in the last few years we've tackled 3, 000, uh, more than 3,000 uh, cyber attacks. It is a risk. Uh, it's a risk that I'm afraid we must run in the cause of freedom. Matt Robert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to offer my wholehearted support for much tougher sanctions against President Putin and his dreadful regime. Mr. Speaker, um, as the Honourable Gentleman from Lockerbie mentioned earlier, there are many historic Ukrainian communities in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and indeed I would like to commend the work of the Reading Ukrainian Centre. I would like to ask the Prime Minister what additional support can the government give to these very valuable community groups and centres around the country who offer such support to families, friends, relatives, both in the UK and in the Ukraine? I think, Mr. Speaker, perhaps the most important thing we can do for uh, the Ukrainian community in, the, in this country is, uh, is, is thank them, recognise them for everything that they've done for us in the, in the last uh, decades. They, they've been an amazing addition uh, to, the, to the UK, to the UK economy, uh, to our cultural and artistic life. John Barron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The House is united in its condemnation, but I suggest to the Prime Minister that the lessons to be addressed from this affair started with the invasion of Georgia, Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008 and not 2014. And given, you know, many of us across the House warned about, have been warning about Russia, and yet the response has been weak. Does the Prime Minister accept that as we enter the battle for democracy globally, we have got to understand that the sooner you, step, you, you square up to the playground bully, the better, and that we adequately support our hard and soft power to do that. Yes, uh, yes uh, he is quite right. And I know that by soft power, uh, he's thinking of also of the, of the British Council, uh, which can have such, uh, such a wonderful uh, beneficial effect uh, across Russia. And I've seen its, I've seen its work across Russia. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, he's right about standing up to the, to the playground 
bully. Uh, we should have done it uh, ages ago. I think the scales have fallen from the eyes of many of our friends and partners. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, in a, an earlier response, the Prime Minister suggested that this country would welcome people who were reuniting with family here. I have a constituent who is Ukrainian, but a British citizen who is trying to bring her mother from Ukraine, but being turned down because she is over 18. Her mother is on her own, has no family, so naturally she is frightened. So will we see a change in the Home Office to enable British citizens who are Ukrainian to bring their vulnerable family here? Yes, I, I thank her very much. I, I think I read out a helpline number in the House uh, uh, on Tuesday. I don't have it uh, again. There is a number both in both in Lviv and in and in this country. But if there's if she could do me the favour uh, and send me the details, uh, well, I'll take them up. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I commend my honourable friend and his ministers for the firm stance they are taking? None of us know where or what Mr. Putin's aims, longer term aims, are. If Ukraine falls, and I fear it might, his covetous eye might land on the Baltic states and other vulnerable countries. Can my right my friend reassure NATO members that if one Russian boot lands on NATO soil, military force will be met? By military force. Yes, and uh, what is so uh, encouraging, Mr. Speaker, is that the whole House understands uh, the vital importance of that Article 5 guarantee that we make to every one of the 30 members of NATO. Tony Lloyd. Sir Tony. The Prime Minister quite rightly pits this as, as being a battle between the party of war and those who support international law. There is only one lawful government in Ukraine. That's the government of President Zelensky. If they are forced to move, forced possibly into exile in the short run or the longer run, will the Prime Minister state very clearly that we will make sure they can be a functional and effective government wherever they operate from? It's a very important point that he raises. I'm grateful, and that's why in our discussions with uh, President Zelensky, we are uh, seeing what we can do to give them uh, the practical uh, support that they need to continue. Robert Jenner. The City of London is a global asset whose enduring success doesn't rest on dirty money. It rests on a commitment to excellence and on the adherence with the rule of law. So it's right that we now use that as a way to show global leadership. Can I encourage my right honourable friend to sanction all of the remaining Russian banks? to sanction the executives associated with them, and I notice that many are resigning today, to publish a further list of individuals, resident in this country or otherwise, to be sanctioned, and to redouble his excellent efforts to suspend Russia from SWIFT as the single most effective immediate step that the West could do to put pressure on Vladimir Putin. I, I thank him very much. I, think, I thank him particularly for his important uh, testimonial uh, to the City of London, uh, whose work should not be, uh, should not be sullied Mr. Speaker, by, uh, by association with ill-gotten uh, Russian money. But the, the, uh, the, the programme that he set out for sanctions is uh, exactly the right one and the one the Government is following. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, returning hate for hate <laughs> multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Will the Prime Minister re reiterate that our quarrel is not with the Russian people? Yeah. It is with their leader, Vladimir yeah. Putin, yeah. and he has committed a very, very grave error. Yeah. Uh, he, he is so right, and I know that that is what the House uh, thinks. We admire the Russian people. Our, uh, our links to the Russian people go back uh, to the time when we stood shoulder to shoulder to fight fascism uh, with the Russian people. Uh, the Russians, uh, Russia's contribution to uh, culture, to art, to literature, is, 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 uh, to music, unparalleled. Uh, it is an extraordinary country, and nothing that we do or say uh, should obscure that. Winston Churchill created the Council of Europe as a bastion against fascism and communism. And since the fall of communism, Russia has set great importance by its membership as a fig leaf of respectability. Every time our Conservative group has tried to get them expelled, we have been foiled by Russian gold. Will the Prime Minister now instruct his ambassador 
on the Council of Europe to move for the immediate expulsion of Russia from the Council of Europe so there is no place for gangsters in the halls of civilised nations. Yeah. I, I, yes, I think uh, eloquently put, Mr Speaker, and he's, he's dead right, and I think that uh, um, my honourable friend Verhenley made the, the, the point uh, the other day, and I certainly, uh, who's on the Council of Europe, and I certainly agree with that. Geraint Davis. Mr Speaker, so many Russians today see the attack on Ukraine as they would see an attack of their father on their mother, because there's such intimate family relationships between these two groups. And today, thousands of Russians are protesting in cities against their domestic law, against this awful war. Will he provide them with his support? Will he amplify their support to help reduce the support, any support there is for this ridiculous war, and also provide uh, sanction and safe haven for people, refugees, including troops who may want to re-engage uh, the, the troops outside of Ukraine so they can re-engage so we can win this war at home and abroad? Uh, he, he makes a series of extremely important observations, and uh, yes, I think it's vital that we, uh, that we uh, get the message across uh, to the whole of Russia about what is really going on. They're being lied to uh, day after day, uh, and I think that his, uh, his point about uh, uh, supporting troops who need uh, uh, temporary exile, as it were, uh, is a very good one. Peter Bell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for yet again coming to House to keep us informed and for his leadership in this crisis. He was right to provide military aid to Ukraine, but the Ukrainian <coughs> ambassador did ask for our support in a no-fly zone today. In his uh, answer earlier, I think the Prime Minister was keeping that option open. Is that correct? Yeah. I think it's pretty clear to the House, Mr Speaker, that we're trying to keep all our options uh, open on this front. Uh, some of them, frankly, uh, may be more practicable uh, than others, and I think we, have to, we must also have uh, a dose of realism about what we can uh, do on the military front. But uh, we will keep all things under review. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, many, of my, many of the residents in my constituency come from a number of the countries on the eastern flank and still have relatives living there. Obviously, like us, they will be deeply concerned about the humanitarian impact of the uh, crisis. So, um, what steps is the government taking to prepare for the humanitarian issues? And with the thousand troops on standby to help with humanitarian assistance, will they now be deployed? I, I think the, the, uh, she raises a very important point, and uh, what we're seeing now, uh, tragically, is, is people moving west uh, out of. Uh, out of Kiev, uh, columns of, of traffic, as, uh, as I'm sure the House knows. Uh, we are uh, people already moving into uh, into southeastern Poland. Uh, there, there is going to be an influx. Uh, I, as I said to the, the President of, uh, of Poland, Prime Minister of Poland, as well, uh, we're there to help. Or a trot. Thank you, Mr. Mm. Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for his statement today and for his strong package of sanctions. Um, I want to ask him about preventing sexual violence in conflict. Um, in November last year, we issued a strong statement which said that the use of sexual violence as a weapon in conflict is a red line akin to the use of chemical weapons. Yep. Will he reaffirm that commitment today? And will he send a strong message to Russia that the international community will not tolerate the use of sexual violence in conflict? Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, I, think I thank her for all the work that she's done on that. Uh, on that issue. Uh, it's something that the, uh, the UK government has campaigned on for, for a long time and indeed uh, raised the issue very greatly in uh, public uh, international consciousness. Uh, I think it, uh, it should be treated uh, as a war crime like uh, any other and people who perpetrate sexual violence in, in conflict uh, can expect uh, to be tried at that, in those tribunals. John Mora. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, in seeking to redraw the boundaries of Europe through bloodshed, Putin has attacked not only the Ukraine but all of us, and we stand in, with the Ukraine in standing for the rule of law. I welcome the sanctions that he's announced, but I was confused by his response on Russian disinformation, which he seemed to imply would be addressed by the online safety bill. That is many, many, many months away. Russian disinformation is organised, their bots are state sponsored. What steps will he take to address them? I thank you. We've got a, a, and she raised a, a good point. But we've got what we're doing is a massive, uh, positive 
uh, Stratcom's campaign uh, in, in Russian, in Ukrainian, uh, to, to make sure that people get the truth and, and they hear the truth. Adam Holloway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as we've noticed this afternoon, virtually everyone in this House has supported the efforts of to re towards resistance over the last few months and in these days. I imagine the House will also support the very different sort of warfare under occupation mm. over the coming months and possibly years. But the House will also have noticed the marvellous way the Prime Minister has spoken directly to the Russian people today. And I hope that he will bear in mind that at the moment public opinion in Russia is rather different. Uh, that does underline the importance of accurate information. Mm. Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, he, he, is, he is quite right, and, uh, and, and, as a, and as I, I thank him. He's a distinguished former soldier, and uh, uh, he knows that uh, truth is the first casualty. Uh, we, have to be, we have to make sure that we are telling uh, people exactly what is going on. And, I, and uh, to the best of my knowledge at the moment, uh, the Ukrainians are resisting much more strongly uh, than, than some people had thought that they would. Uh, who knows uh, how long they can uh, keep going. Let's hope. Uh, and it, they can, and let's encourage them to do so. But, Mr. Speaker, let's get the message out uh, as well. I think it, that, is our, that is our job. Chris Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister is absolutely right. We equivocated shamelessly after Crimea. We were spineless. We must not be spineless now, because what will inevitably happen is either the Baltic states, one of the members of NATO, or perhaps Sweden or Finland will feel the wrath of Putin next. And that will mean. British action. Don't we need to try and set in train now a process why, whereby Putin himself ends up in the dock in a court? Norman Burkett said, who was the alternate British judge at Nuremberg, said at Nuremberg, initiating a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. He must be brought to a court of law and end his days in prison, mustn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I think one of the most fascinating things about what Putin uh, is doing is how close an analogy there is between his actions and those of Slobodan uh, Milosevic. Uh, exactly the same uh, nonsense being peddled about the mystical union between Kosovo uh, and Belgrade as between Kiev and, uh, and Moscow. Exactly the same uh, aggression. And remember that uh, Slobodan Milosevic died on trial. Sorry. Mark Harper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I welcome the package of sanctions set up by the Prime Minister and the fact that he's confirmed more will come. If they are to be successful at punishing President Putin for what he has done to date and deterring him from going further and attacking our NATO partners, they must be sustained. And if they're to be sustained, we must be honest with the British people that there is going to be a cost for them. We are going to have to pay an economic cost, but it's a cost we must pay, and it, is, it pales into insignificance compared to the cost of the people of Ukraine. Yes, and, and not only is that true, Mr Speaker, but the opportunity uh, and the reward for success and being strong is huge. Because if this should end, uh, Mr Speaker, with the rejection of aggression and the rejection of uh, the Putin regime's uh, view of the world, then that would be a massive, massive benefit, uh, and an, an economic benefit as well, uh, to the whole world. Chamberlain. Uh, Mr Speaker, up until May 2021, Valentina Yakaleva was my constituent. She resided in Scotland for 20 years with her daughter and her family. But due to an initial error in an application, she eventually exhausted appeals and was deported with two Covid jags last year. Now that 71-year-old is sheltering in a subway. Um, in response to the uh, Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire, uh, who is no longer in her place, um, I would reiterate, does the Prime Minister agree with me that as we face a likely refugee crisis, the UK must be doing all it can to uh, extract individuals who have immediate family relatives in the UK and urge for uh, support for this case? Yeah, yes. I, again, I thank her very much for drawing the case to my attention. If she sends me the details, I will be happy to, to make sure it is properly taken up uh, by the Home Office.
Can, can I just say, those who didn't get in, we have got a list for next time, because this will definitely not be the end. OK. Let people leave before I come to the adjournment.